in harmony, governed by one eternal law. All that begins must end. The reign of the old Shogunate is over. Hello, brave samurai of Japan. I've got great news for you. You're about to go extinct. Okay, maybe that's not great news for you, but it is for the rest of Japan, because the Meiji era is about to begin. A time when Japan would speedrun centuries of European history and development in just a couple of decades. But it's not all sunshine and sashimi. So much change so quickly also means that Japan will suffer civil strife, economic turmoil, and both civil conflict and wars abroad. But the rewards will be well worth it. Because, by the time of the Meiji Emperor's death, Japan will have transformed itself from a backwards feudal society into one of the world's great powers. So with no further ado, you can call me Ezekiel. And this is how Japan became a modern nation. At the turn of the 17th century, Japan's Warring States period ended in the establishment of a new shogunate under the Tokugawa clan. This regime was known as the Bakufu. The Edo period they oversaw was one of peace, unity, and self-imposed isolation. The turmoil of the Warring States period had been exacerbated by new weapons and religions brought in by the Nanban, European barbarians. They were all banned now, except for the Dutch, who were allowed a base on Tashima Island through which they could trade at Nagasaki. It wouldn't be until the 19th century that this splendid isolation would begin to crack. When, in 1795, revolutionary France occupied the Netherlands, Tashima Station lost its resupply. The Dutch decided to keep the Japanese in the dark by explaining that there had only been some rioting in Paris and chartering American ships to bring in supplies under false Dutch flags. This whole farce would soon be revealed by the British. The United Kingdom was taking temporary control of the Dutch Empire to keep it out of French hands, but when a British vessel showed up at Tashima Station, the Dutch refused to submit to it. Desperate to resupply themselves, the British raided the Japanese coast and left. This is what made the Bakufu realize that something was up. When they demanded an explanation from the Dutch, their conversation went a little something like this. All right, the Dutch, if that's what you're really called, we know you've been lying to us. Those resupply ships are clearly British, and now they're attacking us. You'd better have a good explanation for all of this. Oh, uh, <laughs> yeah, those resupply ships aren't actually British anymore. They're called Americans now that they've won their independence. Well, that explains why they both look the same. So who's the king of these Americans? Oh, they don't have one. Their leader was offered a crown but refused so America could become a republic. Amazing. He must have been a real Confucian sage. <laughs> yeah, Confucian sage. You still haven't explained why the British attacked us. Okay, okay, fine. So, there weren't just riots in Paris. There was actually a full-on revolution that killed the entire royal family. And now this funny little fun-sized French guy named Napoleon is in charge, and he's taking over everything. And now the British are trying to take over our empire too. Wow, Napoleon-chan sounds like one of our daimyo warlords. Sure, you can totally think of Napoleon as a three-foot samurai. Hey, I'm average height for the time, you jerk! The next insight the Japanese gained into Europe happened thanks to the Opium War of 1839. They were horrified to watch as a small flotilla and 4,000 men brought the entire Qing Empire to its knees. The Japanese asked the Dutch for an explanation. How could a people as brave as the Manchus lose to such a small invasion? The Dutch explained that Europe was modernizing. And in modern war, bravery alone was not enough to win. In the coming years, an increasing number of European vessels appeared off of Japan's coast. In 
Until, in 1846, two American warships led by Captain James Biddle dared to enter Edo Bay. The Japanese informed Biddle that foreign relations were only handled at Nagasaki. So, lacking authorization to use force, Biddle peacefully left. This first American attempt to open Japan may have been a failure, but they'd be back. And next time, they'd be authorized to use force. But first, I want to give a huge shout out to this video's sponsor, you. Because without you guys watching at home, this channel wouldn't be possible. Some of you have even gone above and beyond by supporting our work on Patreon. So I want to extend a special invitation for you to join them. All you need to do is click the link in the description. Our patrons don't just finance these videos, they get awesome rewards too. These include access to exclusive chat rooms on our Discord server where you'll have direct access to me, the ability to add one or more country balls to the group shot featured at the end of each video, and getting your name into the credits. For our biggest supporters, I'll even read your name aloud at the end of each video. Your support is what makes videos like this one possible, so let's get back to it. In addition to trade, the United States had two unique interests in Japan. The first was to protect shipwrecked American whalers, who were reportedly being mistreated whenever washing up in Japan. The second was to open Japanese ports for use as coaling stations, which were needed to support America's growing empire in the Pacific. Thus, on July 2nd, 1853, Commodore Perry's flotilla of four black ships, the Korofune, steamed into Edo Bay. Authorized to use force, Commodore Perry demanded to deliver two letters to the Emperor. After a series of increasingly impressive shows of force from each side, Perry was allowed to land. To deliver his letters, the Commodore and his guard of modern marines would march through rows of samurai armed with 17th century firearms, all overseen by his black ships ready to bombard the coast if anything went wrong. Luckily, nothing did. Perry delivered his letters, along with a personal gift of white flags. He then explained that he would be back in May, surveyed the coast against Japanese wishes, and left. The first letter was from the American president, laying out his demands and threatening a war that Japan was sure to lose if they were not met. The second was written by Perry himself. It said all of the same things, and added the flourish that the white flags he had gifted them would prove useful in case they chose war. These events all had a profound effect on Japanese politics. Before, the Bakufu had repressed all meaningful political life. Now, Japan's feudal lords, the daimyo, took the opportunity to voice their opinions. Unfortunately, there was little consensus to be found. The situation became even worse when a Russian expedition arrived, trying to get their own concessions before the Americans did, which prompted Commodore Perry to return in February with even more ships. It was clear that Japan had no choice. The Nanban would have to be allowed into the country once more. The agreement struck up with Perry opened two harbors to American ships, promised to assist shipwrecked American whalers, and allowed an American consul to take up residency in Japan. Overall, it was a shockingly lenient treaty, giving Perry every item he needed to leave satisfied and not a single thing more. For the newly opened Japan, problems began immediately. Other Western powers swooped in to get their own unequal treaties. Inflation became rampant, as merchants quickly discovered that Japanese bullion was cheaper than in the rest of the world, causing precious metals to flow out of the country. And, if any of that wasn't bad enough, Japan was struck by multiple earthquakes and a tsunami. The arrival of the American ambassador in 1856 heralded another round of demands, mainly to open more ports to trade. 
This time, the Americans didn't even bother with the gunboats, instead pointing out the ongoing Second Opium War. The futility of resisting was highlighted by the sight of China getting crushed by a small western expedition for the second time. The Americans also pointed out that if the Japanese didn't strike a deal with them, the British were sure to come next, and they would want to introduce destructive opium into Japan. Once again, the shogunate was left with no choice but to sign another round of treaties. But from its perspective, this was only a temporary setback. The Bakufu saw these concessions as a way to buy time, so it could acquire enough modern weapons and training to drive the foreigners out of the country. The only problem was that many in Japan opposed this plan. A growing opposition saw these treaties as a humiliation and betrayal, preferring to take up arms now and expel the foreigners immediately. Leading this faction were the Tokugawa clan's traditional enemies in the south, Choshu and Satsuma. These southern domains were even modernizing their own forces in anticipation of a conflict. While the Bakufu, based in Edo, was the real power in Japan, it technically owed its fealty to the court and emperor in Kyoto. The once powerless Kyoto government was now asserting itself by refusing to sign the new treaties. This forced the Bakufu to sign them unilaterally, and then to twist arms to get Kyoto's assent. The radicals saw this divide as an opportunity. Radical samurai started traveling to Kyoto, where they conspired to free the emperor from the shogun's clutches. In 1862, Satsuma anti-foreign samurai murdered a British merchant after refusing to dismount for a court noble. The Bakufu agreed to pay reparations, but the Satsuma clan neither apologized for the incident nor arrested the killer. The result was the Anglo-Satsuma War, wherein a Royal Navy squadron burned three Satsuma trade ships and bombarded Kagoshima. Meanwhile, assassinations and street fighting between pro-emperor and pro-shogun radicals ravaged Kyoto. The violence reached its peak in August of 1864, when 3,000 men, including 1,400 Choshu samurai, assaulted the imperial palace in a botched attempt to rescue the emperor, but whose only real outcome was accidentally burning down much of the capital. And that wasn't the only trouble coming out of Choshu. To appease the radicals, the Bakufu adopted a resolution from the emperor to drive the foreigners out of Japan. While the shogun had no intention of enforcing the decree, Choshu went ahead and enforced it themselves. This would lead to another Western intervention that ended in a combined American, British, French, and Dutch flotilla destroying most of Choshu's military forces, including several of their modern gunboats. As more of Japan rose up against the Bakufu, the shogun was forced to call on troops from its vassals. With their support, an uprising in Mito, just outside the shogunate capital of Edo, was crushed, and 21 daimyo prepared to march on the radicals of Choshu. But the Choshu situation resolved itself when its radical leaders were replaced by conservatives. From the looks of things, everything was turning up Tokugawa. The ascendant Bakufu tried to reassert its control over Japan, first by enforcing old regulations on the daimyo, like requiring they spend every other year living in the capital, and later by gathering support for a second expedition to break Choshu, which the shogun felt hadn't been properly punished for their last uprising. But the shogun was overreaching. Few complied with the regulations, and no one wanted to crush Choshu. The Satsuma clan, who had brokered the truce between Choshu and the Bakufu, were especially concerned. While they were Choshu's rivals, Satsuma feared that the shogun would march on them if Choshu fell. So Satsuma must have been horrified when the radicals seized back control in Choshu, allowing the Bakufu to finally form a second expedition to destroy them. The summer of 1866 would see the Bakufu's army march into Choshu, only to be ground to a halt by a combination of Choshu's superior modernization and a lack of commitment from the invading daimyo. 
In that same year, both the Emperor and Shogun died of natural causes, leaving Japan in the hands of a teenage Emperor and the man who would be its last Shogun, Tokugawa Yoshinobu. With the Bakufu suddenly weaker than ever, the Tosa clan brokered an alliance between the old rivals of Choshu and Satsuma. The three of them purchased large amounts of foreign weapons and warships, and hired foreign advisors to show them how to use all of it. 1867 was a truly remarkable year in Japan. Choshu and Satsuma, the leaders of the pro-emperor anti-foreigner faction, somehow ended up being the most rapidly modernizing force in the country. The shogunate, despite having much more foreign support, was falling dangerously behind them. And in the middle was poor Tosa, who had formed the Choshu Satsuma alliance, but didn't actually want them to march on the capital. So in a last desperate attempt to prevent civil war, the Tosa proposed a compromise, one that would weaken, but not totally destroy the Bakufu, while also modernizing the nation. On November 9th, 1867, Tokugawa Yoshinobu accepted the terms, but Satsuma and Choshu didn't. They wanted to complete the destruction of their ancient Tokugawa enemies, and fully restore the emperor to power. So on January 3rd, 1868, Restorationist troops marched into Kyoto. They restored the now 15-year-old emperor to power, who took on the name Meiji, meaning enlightened rule. The same day, Choshu and Satsuma demanded the total surrender of all Tokugawa lands. Tokugawa Yoshinobu retreated to Osaka Castle, held talks with the foreign powers, and on January 17th, officially rejected the restoration. The Boshin War had begun. Broadly speaking, the Restorationist Alliance of Choshu, Satsuma, and Tosa had the support of Southern Japan and the Emperor, as well as much more modern military forces. Meanwhile, the Shogun and his supporters dominated the North, and enjoyed much more international recognition. And, while both sides had their foreign military missions recalled, some of the French advisors stayed behind and continued training the Shogun's troops. The first battle was fought between January 27th and 28th at Toba and Fushimi, when 15,000 shogunate troops advancing on Kyoto were met by 5,000 restorationists, mostly Choshu and Satsuma men. While outnumbered, the restorationists had a massive advantage in modern rifles, artillery, and even a Gatling gun. These modern weapons were enough to halt the shogun's forces, but not break them. On the second day of the battle, word arrived of an imperial decree, naming Tokugawa Yoshinobu an enemy of the court, and establishing the Restorationists as the official imperial army. This meant that any man who continued to resist them would be a traitor to the emperor. In response, the shogunate army either defected or fled. The only good news for Yoshinobu was that his navy sunk a troop transport off the coast. On the 29th of March, 3,000 Imperials defeated 300 Shogunate soldiers at Koshu Katsunuma, opening the road to Edo. The Shogun's capital was captured on July 4th, along with the Shogun himself. Tokugawa Yoshinobu was stripped of all his titles and placed under house arrest. Then, on September 3rd, Edo was renamed to Tokyo, Eastern Capital, and made the new capital of Japan. While the Tokugawa shogunate was defeated, many of its supporters in the north continued to resist in the form of the Northern Alliance. While the Northern Domains had an impressive total of 50,000 troops, few of them were modern. As the Imperial Army marched north, their first resistance came from the Nagaoka, whose forces boasted two Gatling guns, 2,000 French rifles, and were under advice from two supposed military advisors, though they really were just Prussian arms dealers. After changing hands three times, their stronghold at Nagaoka Castle fell on September 15th. The Imperial Army was then challenged at Bonari Pass, the gateway to Aizu territory, but outnumbered 2,000 to 700, the Northern Alliance was defeated there too. Aizu Castle would be taken on November 6th. The surviving Northern Alliance forces evacuated to Japan's northernmost island of Ezo. There, they planned to secede from Japan, 
and form a new country, the Ezo Republic, with a constitution based on the United States. Their military assets included 15,000 soldiers, a fleet of four steamships, two sail ships, and two transports, and the continued support of those French advisors who'd stayed in Japan. On March 20, 1869, the Imperial flagship Kotetsu and its escorts arrived in the northern port of Miyako. This vessel, formerly the Confederate ship Stonewall, was Japan's first ironclad. No ship in the Republic's fleet could penetrate her armor. So to save their nascent country, the Republicans came up with a daring plan. They would send ships flying the American flag to sneak alongside the Kotetsu and board her rendering her iron cladding useless. Three vessels were sent, but one was forced to turn back due to bad weather, and another because of engine trouble. Only the third vessel managed to get alongside the Kotetsu and dispense its boarding party. But they would be repulsed by the ship's crew and an on-deck Gatling gun. The Republic's fate was sealed. On April 9th, thousands of Imperial troops landed on Ezo, while the Republic's fleet was destroyed in a series of engagements in May. The final Republican stronghold of Goryakaku Fort fell on June 27, 1869, destroying the Ezo Republic and ending the Boshin War in imperial victory. While the Tokugawa lands were seized, Tokugawa Yoshinobu himself was allowed to retire in peace. His supporters were treated just as leniently, with many being pardoned and allowed back into government. Work on modernizing Japan began immediately. Even before Perry's arrival, many Japanese were fascinated by the outside world. Forbidden to leave the country, these xenophilic scholars studied books imported and translated from the Dutch. Now that the country was open, students and scholars jumped at the opportunity to learn from the outside world firsthand. The Meiji government was more than happy to support these efforts, issuing as many as 11,000 passports between 1868 and 1902. Many of those expatriates would become key national leaders after their return. Religious reform was also on the agenda. Before now, the Buddhist and Shinto faiths were closely integrated, with nearly every Buddhist temple also featuring a Shinto shrine, and the monks servicing both. Now, the plan was to transform Shinto into an exclusive national cult with the emperor as its head priest. But as it turned out, forcibly separating the shrines and harassing Buddhist worship was very unpopular. Confucianism, another influential force in Japan, also resisted state Shinto. This resistance, combined with Shinto xenophobia getting in the way of modernization, meant that only a moderate version of state Shinto would be implemented. Compared to the Edo period, Meiji Japan was much more tolerant of Christianity. And by that, I mean the faith wasn't completely banned. When Christian missionaries arrived, they were pleasantly surprised to find their congregations filled with Japanese Christians who'd kept their faith hidden for centuries, a discovery which the government was much less happy about. Another top priority for the Meiji government was education, with a particular emphasis on physical education, literacy, and foreign languages. English was pushed especially hard, and was highly praised for its efficient Latin alphabet. There was even talk of making English the official language of Japan. While that obviously didn't happen, it did lead to reforms simplifying the Japanese language. One of the first acts of Japan's new imperial government was to centralize the nation by nationalizing its feudal realms. This turned the once powerful daimyo into mere governors, with no hereditary rights. Later, the over 300 domains would be consolidated into just 50 prefectures, and with governors appointed by the imperial government. In 1873, Japan passed both its first conscription law and welcomed back the foreign missions to resume military modernization. The navy would always be guided by British advisors, while the army continued to follow French instructors until transitioning to the German model in the 1880s. All of this was bad news for the samurai class. 
the conscript army meant an end to their traditional role as hereditary warriors. The government was also abolishing all of the cushy bureaucratic offices the Bakufu had created to keep them busy during the Edo period, and turned their permanent stipends into temporary bonds. The samurai even lost their symbolic rights, such as to wear swords and topknots, and to strike down commoners who disrespected them. The government was hoping that the samurai would just find new jobs. And, while many made the transition, others resisted. Disgruntled samurai rose up in Hizen, Saga, Choshu, and Kumamoto. The most significant of these disgruntled samurai was one of the leaders of the restorationist cause, Saigo Takamori. Takamori suggested preserving the samurai class by invading Korea to create a new samurai society there. The argument this sparked in the government became about much more than just Korea, such as Japan's fear of invoking Western interventions, and whether the Meiji government should be ruled by military men like Saigo or reformist bureaucrats. In the end, Takamori failed to get his invasion, so he resigned from his post and returned home to Kagoshima. There, he plotted to save the samurai his own way, even if it meant fighting the imperial government he helped create. Under Saigo Takamori's watch, Kagoshima became filled with military training camps, often disguised as private schools. Disgruntled samurai traveled from across Japan to learn the ways of modern warfare. By 1876, Satsuma had functionally seceded from Japan. The imperial government tried sending spies to Kagoshima, but the operation was botched and ended with one of the agents captured and forced to sign a likely false confession that he was sent to assassinate Takamori. Later, a warship was sent to secure a weapon stockpile in the prefecture, only to discover that Saigo's men had already raided it. With that, Saigo's men rose up, and the Satsuma Rebellion began. Saigo's army of 15,000 samurai invaded the neighboring Kumamoto prefecture and attacked its castle stronghold on February 22, 1877. But after two days of fighting, their assaults were repelled, forcing the rebels to dig in for a siege. The army would grow to 20,000 men, as more disgruntled samurai arrived to join the rebellion, but that was cold comfort against the 90,000 imperial troops marching to stop them. 15,000 rebels were dispatched to fight the Imperials in what would become the Battle of Taburuzaka, which was really a weeks-long series of skirmishes fought in heavy rain. The battle ended on the 20th of March, with each side suffering 4,000 casualties, and Saigo's forces driven from the field. Even worse, Imperial troops landed behind rebel lines and occupied Kagoshima. The siege of Kumamoto Castle continued until April 12th, when enough Imperial troops arrived to force the rebels to retreat. Since his home province was already occupied, Saigo's army fled to Miyazaki, where they fought a long campaign of retreats and rearguard actions, pursuing no particular objective other than survival. Saigo's army would eventually be reduced to 500 men, held out in a mountain outside Kagoshima. Surrounded, outnumbered, and doomed, they charged into Imperial lines to die fighting. So leave a cherry blossom emoji in the comments to commemorate the last stand of the samurai. The Satsuma Rebellion stretched the Meiji government to its limits. 65,000 men had to be mobilized, of whom 6,000 died and 10,000 were wounded. The rebels lost 18,000 men. Saigo Takamori would receive an imperial pardon in 1889, with his story upheld as exemplifying Japanese values. But, in spite of his sacrifice, Saigo Takamori's greatest fears were to be realized. The government would soon totally abolish the samurai class, and in less than a generation, Japan would be totally unrecognizable. The Imperial Treasury Already strained by the liabilities taken on from nationalizing the domains, was now in even deeper debt thanks to putting down the samurai rebellions. This situation was made even worse by the Meiji regime's attempts to run the economy through state-run banks and monopolies. 
This planned economy would be such a failure that the government was forced to liberalize in the 1880s. Land was turned into a capital asset, and government businesses were privatized. Lastly, to rein in the inflation still plaguing the country, the government both raised taxes and slashed spending. All of this left little money for the military, who, nonetheless, undertook their first overseas adventure in 1874. Back in 71, 54 Japanese sailors were massacred by natives on the Qing-controlled island of Taiwan, an incident which the Qing denied responsibility for. So now, three years later, Japan dispatched troops to occupy the island, only leaving after the Chinese agreed to pay an indemnity. The Japanese won another success in 1879, when they abolished the Okinawa monarchy and annexed the islands, something which the Qing protested vigorously, as they claimed the islands as a tributary. But islands and indemnities were just the beginning of Japan's ambitions. Just because Saigo couldn't get his invasion earlier in the decade didn't mean the Japanese government was disinterested in Korea. The Americans tried and failed to open the country in 1871, leaving the Japanese free to make their attempt in 75. Where the Americans failed, the Japanese succeeded, imposing an unequal treaty on Korea much like the ones Japan was still bound to by the West. Three Korean ports were open to trade, Japanese citizens won extraterritoriality, and Korea was declared independent from Chinese hegemony. Other Western powers swooped in to claim their own unequal treaties. Japan had truly learned from the best. Korea was open to the world. With assistance from Japan, Korean government officials quickly began modernizing their country. But all of this modernizing and hobnobbing with Japan was unwelcome to Korea's former suzerain of China. The Qing Empire had no intention of losing the peninsula to Japanese upstarts. Thus, a Korean great game began. In 1882, Korea's Yangban class, not unlike the samurai, revolted alongside the army. This emo incident culminated in an assault on the Japanese legation and Korean royal palace, which killed many officials from both countries. Japan and China each sent 4,500 troops to put down the uprising, but the end result was the empowerment of pro-China reactionaries. They realigned Korea with the Qing, and forced Japan to reduce its troop presence to a small guard for its legation. In 1884, Pro-Japanese modernizers launched their own coup, which was time to coincide with a reduction in the Chinese garrison to fight France in the Tonkin War. But even the reduced garrison was enough to stop them. And amidst the chaos, the Japanese legation was burned and 40 of its officials killed. The surviving Korean modernizers were forced to take refuge in Japan. But while the coup was a disaster, the Japanese used it as an excuse to send troops onto the peninsula, and so pressure China, still distracted by their war with France, to sign the Tianjin Agreement. Under its terms, neither nation would be allowed to have a major troop presence in Korea, and if either side wanted to reintroduce soldiers, they would first have to inform the other. By 1894, Japan ended its deflationary period, and successfully negotiated reforms to its unequal treaties. This meant there was finally enough money available for proper military commitments in Korea. The situation on the peninsula had become heated in March, when one of the most important Korean modernizers, Kim ak yeon was assassinated in Shanghai. But the real violence began in June, with the outbreak of the Dongkok Rebellion, a result of incompetence and overtaxation by Korea's reactionary government. At Seoul's request, China sent 2,000 troops without informing Japan, hoping to put down the rebellion before the Japanese could respond. But the Japanese found out anyway, and, outraged, rushed 8,000 troops to Incheon by mid-June. As Japanese troops crushed the rebels in the south, they found themselves in practical occupation of the region. The Korean king demanded they leave, but the Japanese instead decided to use this as an opportunity to settle the Korean question once and for all. The Japanese presented the Korean king with a reform plan that would functionally turn the nation into a Japanese client. 
Naturally, the king rejected the proposal, which prompted the Japanese to politely but firmly insist that the king reconsider by occupying Seoul on July 23rd, capturing the king in his palace. The Japanese then installed a puppet regime that authorized them to expel the Chinese troops from Korea. So on July 25th, 1894, with the Qing refusing to recognize the puppet government, fighting between Chinese and Japanese troops broke out across the peninsula. The First Sino-Japanese War had begun. With the Korea Strait between Japan and the mainland, control of the seas would be essential to any Japanese victory. Until recently, China did not have a unified navy, but four rival regional fleets. But after their defeat in the Tonkin War, the Chinese were down to just one, the Beiyang, or Northern Seas Fleet. Unfortunately for Japan, the Beiyang happened to be China's most powerful. All of its ships were modern British and German-built designs. Their crews were trained by foreign instructors. The fleet even had its own modern Marine Corps. The Imperial Japanese Navy was roughly the same size, except in destroyers, in which it outnumbered the Chinese 26 to 13. However, the Chinese vessels were generally larger and more powerful than Japan's. The Imperial Japanese Navy first met the Chinese at Pengdou, where they sunk several transports. The troops and heavy equipment inside were supposed to reinforce a Chinese army along the Ansong River, who, without these reinforcements, were easily defeated and pursued to Pyongyang by the Japanese army. The Chinese force defending Pyongyang was much more substantial, 13,000 men supported by artillery and six machine guns. Lacking sufficient forces, the Japanese awaited reinforcements, while the Chinese fortified the city. Then, on September 15th, the Japanese attacked with 18,000 men. The Chinese held Pyongyang until heavy rains destroyed their earthworks, and the Japanese captured a hill behind them. Japanese artillery from that hill forced the Chinese troops to either surrender or flee en masse. There aren't any good casualty numbers for the 1894 Battle of Pyongyang, but the Chinese definitely suffered way more losses than the Japanese, including many of their most modern troops. Victory at Pyongyang put the Japanese in control over the entire Korean peninsula, but the Chinese weren't defeated yet, so 13,000 Japanese troops marched north to the Yalu River, marking the border between Korea and Chinese Manchuria. There, they were met by 23,000 entrenched Chinese soldiers, supported by the Beiyang fleet. On the 17th of September, the Imperial Japanese Navy and Chinese Beiyang fleet met at the Battle of the Yalu River. As the Japanese steamed forward, the Beiyang fleet failed to form a proper line, accidentally forming a wedge. Firing commenced when a Japanese flying squadron of four cruisers made a passing run against the Chinese fleet. After damaging two of their cruisers, the squadron traveled up the Yalu River to engage other Chinese vessels before rejoining the main battle. Between Japan's faster-firing guns, superior crews, and China's poor fleet deployment, the Chinese got the worst of the fighting. When Japanese guns proved too light to penetrate some of the Chinese vessels' armor, they just turned to sweep the crews off their unprotected decks. By the time the battle was over, the Japanese lost no ships, though four were seriously damaged. The Chinese, on the other hand, lost four cruisers, with many more damaged. The remains of the Beiyang fleet limped back to the Laotung Peninsula for repairs. Meanwhile, along the Yalu River, the Japanese army secretly built a pontoon bridge and used it to outflank its defenders. As the Chinese retreated, the Japanese split their forces to occupy as much of Manchuria as possible, and opened a second front by landing troops on the Laodong Peninsula. As the Japanese advanced up Laodong, the Chinese evacuated their fleet to the Shandong Peninsula on the mainland. Although Port Arthur was defended by 10,000 men, her people rioted and the garrison panicked, allowing the Japanese to capture it in just one day. 
Over the course of the war, the Japanese had not treated the Chinese or Koreans particularly well. But at Port Arthur, their behavior became atrocious. After hearing reports that Chinese troops had fired their weapons after surrendering, and that Japanese prisoners had been mutilated, the Japanese massacred between several hundred and several thousand of their prisoners. With the Beiyang fleet still afloat at Huawei, Japan's victory was not yet total. So on January 18, 1895, Japanese forces landed nearby and captured the city on February 2nd. The Beiyang fleet, trapped in the bay, was continuously attacked by the Japanese until the 10th, when its flagship was scuttled and the rest of the fleet surrendered. China wouldn't have a blue water navy again for a hundred years. By March 24th, continued defeats in Manchuria and Japanese landings near Haichau forced the Qing to the negotiating table. On April 17, 1895, these talks culminated in the signing of the Treaty of Shimano Seki. It was a far harsher peace than any of those imposed on China by a Western power. Shimono Seki included an indemnity large enough to cover Japan's war expenses, forced the Qing to renounce suzerainty over Korea, and ceded the Laotung Peninsula, Taiwan, and the nearby Pescadores Islands to Japan. The Japanese also won every right of a Western-style unequal treaty with China. For Japan, the actual occupation of Taiwan and the Pescadores would prove as deadly as the Sino-Japanese War itself. 1,500 men would be lost on the Pescadores, while in Taiwan, local elites declared an independent republic, raised an army of Hakkas, the same people who led the Taiping Rebellion, and forged an alliance with the island's warlike natives. Between the disease, fighting, and guerrilla warfare from the natives, the pacification of Taiwan cost Japan at least another 3,000 dead and 500 wounded. Japan's unexpected victory in the Sino-Japanese War showcased to the world just how far the country had come. Japan even started to seem more like a Western power than an Asian one. This progress is best highlighted by the adoption of the Japanese Constitution, a process that began all the way back in 1876. At first, the ideas behind constitutional government were very difficult for the Japanese to understand. Many concepts made little sense to a nation steeped in the East Asian tradition. Freedom, GU, had overtones of Taoism, while Confucian struggled to understand the concept at all. People's rights, Minkin, was also tough to find an Asian allegory for. In translations of Western literature, the words for society and government were often confused. In spite of that, Early political parties formed in the 1880s to argue monetary policy, constitutional law, and whether to follow in the English or French liberal traditions. In the words of historian Marius B. Jansen, It is astonishing to see that within 15 years of the Tokugawa fall, and at a time when there were no functioning parliaments outside of Europe and the United States, the dispute in Japan was not over whether there should be a constitution, but over who should draw one up and what it should contain. But Japan had no plans to become a republic. To protect the imperial house, a new peerage system was created in 1884, with 600 new peers. The emperor was further protected from political turmoil with the creation of a cabinet to act on his behalf, and to take the blame whenever something went wrong. The final draft of the constitution was approved on February 11, 1889. This would be Japan's National Foundation Day. The first elections took place in July of 1890, with an electorate composed of men who paid a minimum tax. Of the 450,000 qualified voters, 97% showed up to cast their ballot. And, in a show of just how shattered the old class system was, only 109 former samurai were elected, alongside 191 commoners. But for all of these successes, Japan still hadn't achieved complete equality with the West. The first sign was the Triple Intervention wherein France, Germany, and Russia banded together to offer Japan some friendly advice that they should probably give up the Laotung Peninsula, 
the Japanese took the hint and sold it back to China. Even more humiliating, the Qing were so weakened by their defeat that it triggered another scramble among the Western powers for Chinese concessions, during which the Russians took Lao Tung for themselves. Japanese gains in Korea prove just as hollow. Their puppet government proved surprisingly resistant to reform, and things got really bad when the Japanese army, without orders from Tokyo, sent Japanese troops disguised as Koreans to participate in a coup, storming the palace, stabbing the queen, and killing several members of the royal household staff. Japan recalled the general responsible for this, and apologized to the Koreans. But that didn't save the Japanese from losing even more influence in February, when the Korean king and crown prince fled to the Russian legation in Seoul. Between that and the triple intervention, all Japan had really won from their war with China were a few islands off the Chinese coast and the replacement of Qing influence in Korea with that of the far more dangerous Russia. Another war over Korea, Lao Tang, and the fate of East Asia itself was just 10 years away. But that's a story for another time, because this has been how Japan became a modern nation. This video was funded by the loyal samurai of Satsuma province, looking to overthrow the imperial government in the name of the emperor to save the emperor from his imperial government, and so preserve their way of life. Including their brave daimyo leaders, G.S. Rogers, Josiah, Peter, the Raven Union, the Union of X, and Viceroy Ethan Albert. Links to where you can join them are in the description. Like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell for more. I'll see you in the next one.